Welcome to Pecan Baptist Church. Our vision and purpose is to love God, love others, introduce people to Jesus Christ, and watch them grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, helping them as they lead their friends and family to Christ. We pray that this message will bring you into a closer relationship with God and help you as you live the life He has given to you. Great to see you guys here today. Now we're going to be continuing in the book of Jonah. And for those of you, if you're first time visitors, which we have quite a few today, I'll tell you, all of our services are recorded on YouTube. And so if you want to go back, I think this is, if I remember right, this is the third message so far out of Jonah. If you want to go back and catch up, you can do that. Just look up Pecan, Pecan Church on YouTube. So now we're going to be continuing with Jonah. And Jonah is kind of a, a character in a way, isn't he? He's really kind of a reluctant prophet or a disobedient prophet. And he finds himself stowed away on a ship and rebellion against God, going the other way from where God told him to go. His task was to go to the Ninevites. Go to the Ninevites and preach that they are going to be destroyed unless they repent. But Jonah hates the Ninevites, and he doesn't want to go to them. And he knows God is a merciful, loving God, who if they repent, then he will not bring upon judgment upon them or destruction. So now today in verse 7, we see there's a great storm that comes upon the ship. And they've already cast all the cargo overboard, and it just looks dire. The men, the sailors are terrified. They think they're going to sink. So at chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, a couple things here. This is interesting because a couple things are related to this. First of all, this is not a coincidence that the lots fell on Jonah. But you also have to remember that these men, they don't know who God is. And here is Jonah hiding on the boat. He's hiding from them. He has the truth. Why do you think this storm has come upon them? It's come upon them because of Jonah's sin, but also for the purpose of seeing these sailors come to know who the one true God is. That's the purpose. And storms are like that. Whatever the storm is in our lives, they're like that. They can serve a purpose for the Lord if we're looking for it. Now, Jonah is not looking for it. He doesn't even care. He's hiding. He was probably hoping that the lots would land on somebody else. But no, they didn't. And guys, I tell you, if we, we pray, and, and I'll, I'll try to pray it today when we go out these doors, God, lead God and direct us. Put us where you want us to be. And then give us the words to say when you get us there. And, if, and then we are surprised when something like that happens, and we call it a coincidence. We need to be paying attention of what's going on around us. This is not a coincidence that happened. Now, look what these men are turning to. You know, people that do not know the truth, who the one true God is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ, people who don't know that, they're going to turn to all kinds of things. They may turn to superstitions. They may turn to, well, casting lots, maybe to gambling. They may turn to addictions of some type. They're gonna, people are looking for answers. And look, the one person on the boat who has the answers is not willing to tell them. The words are going to have to be pried out of his mouth. Now in verse 8, look at what the men say. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? For what people are you? So now, this is amazing too, because here you have this prophet. Jonah is a prophet of God. So he's supposed to be a man of God. And here he is on this boat in the middle of a storm, and they don't know who he is. You know, guys, people in our sphere of influence should know where we stand, should know that we have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not everybody's called to be a preacher, but we're all called to share the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in whatever way God calls us to do it. I've heard it said before, if nobody around you knows you're a Christian, either you're not a Christian or you're acting like Jonah. That's the way it is. So we need to, we need to be a light in this dark world. There are storms. We've been through some storms. There's going to be more storms. You know what? Storms and problems are just opportunities for us to show who we are. You know, it's easy. It's easy when everything is great, but you want to do something unexpected, Live joyfully in a storm. Live confidently in a storm. Don't be overcome by fear. Then, all of a sudden, you look really strange to a worldly, unbelieving person. Peculiar as we are. 
So tell us who you are. Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Finally, finally, their words were practically pried out of his mouth. But he told them, know what? I am, he already told them once before he was running from his God. But now he's told them, I am the God of the Hebrews, the God of the land, the God of the sea, the God of all creation. Then the men became extremely frightened and said to him, now why were they so frightened about this? You know, I got to thinking about this text right here. What made them so frightened? Do you think they knew of the legends, right, of the legends of the God of the Hebrews with the Red Sea crossing? Do you think they knew of those things? Maybe they knew of the conquest in Cana, the ten plagues of Egypt that brought a, a massive dynasty to its knees. And maybe now they're realizing, you know what, that's not just legend. We're living through the wrath of the God of heaven, the God of the land, God of the sea, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Israelites who came out of Egypt. They're living through this now, and they, here is a prophet of this God, and he already told them he was running, and that this is his fault. So the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, how could you do this? Now think of the impact of those words. How could you do this? He knows he's the problem, and he still hasn't told anybody. Well, he just did, but they made him. How could you do this? You know what's interesting? How does a man of God get so backwards? You know, how does, we don't know Jonah's backstory. We know very little about his backstory. We know he was living in, a, in the, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was not a good place. I mean, it was a, a place of all kinds of bad stuff. Let's just put it that way. Idolatry, child sacrifice was going on too, all kinds of things like that. And so people weren't really listening to his messages. You know, maybe he was very disgruntled. Maybe he was depressed. Maybe he experienced some great loss. Don't really know the backstory on him. But how did he get this way? You know, this right here, think of this. This storm that these sailors are going through, this is going to end up being the best thing that ever happened to them. I mean, they're terrified. They've thrown the cargo overboard. They think they're going to die. But it's going to end up being the best thing that happens to them. See, and that's the truth, guys. Storms or problems, whatever they are, storms, problems, plus the truth results in salvations. It does. So God is wanting to see these sailors saved. Like I told you last week, couldn't God have turned Jonah around before he got on the boat? I mean, he could have done that in a number of ways. He could have had him kidnapped, taken to Nineveh. I mean, it could have been happening almost any which way. But God allowed him to get on that boat. Then God allowed that great storm to come upon the boat so these sailors could hear the truth. Who is the one true God? Jonah is in such a bad way. You know, they ask him, do you even care? Do you even, how could you do this to us? Do you even care at all? I want to turn back now to Psalm chapter 1, one of my favorite psalms. But how do we end up like this? I think every one of us in this room has, been, has behaved like Jonah before. Psalm chapter 1, look, I love this, how this goes in the first verse. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Do you see the progression? First, he's kind of passing by, and he, and he hears the counsel of the wicked. Then now he's standing in the path of sinners, so he's stopped. And then there's another progression. Now he's sitting in the seat of scoffers. And that's the way it is. You know, sometimes people just go off the deep end. They do. But at the same time, what usually happens, and what probably happened to Jonah, was it was kind of a slow progression backwards backwards and backwards and backwards until he doesn't even look like somebody that could be, you're a prophet, you're a man of God, who would ever thought it? But guys, we have to fight against that. And I've said this before, if we're not moving closer to God, then we're going further away from him. There's no standing still in this matter. So keep working on your spiritual life, your spiritual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep growing, keep growing and fight against the trend of going backwards because we don't want to end up 
even more like Jonah than we currently are. Now look, this, this guy, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers, basically, in the will of the Lord, correct? So now this is the opposite of Jonah. Do you think he looks like a tree planted by streams of water who is yielding its fruit in season? No, he doesn't, and sometimes we don't either. But at the same time, we have to fight. If this can happen to a prophet, a man of God, to end up in such a sad, sad spiritual state, it can happen to any of us, and it probably has. But we have to fight against that. I'm going to move back over to Jonah now. So they ask him, how could you do this? See, for the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy, so it was continuing to build and to continue to get worse. And guys, it is bad when they already throw all the cargo overboard, and it's getting worse, and it's getting worse. Time is running out. What should we do to you, they proclaim. Look at this in verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Now, see, Jonah still, I don't think he fully understands the implications of what's going on. But at the same time, why couldn't Jonah just throw himself into the sea? He's laying that burden upon these men also. Not only has he brought about this calamity on them, but now he's telling them, you have to throw me in. I'm not going to jump in. Man, what a backwards man of God. Remember, Jesus Christ said that this, this I'll give you no other sign but the sign of Jonah, right? I will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And as Jonah was in the whale, the great fish, great sea monster, whatever you want to call it. But there's some big differences between Jonah and Christ. Can you see that? Christ willingly went to the cross. He allowed himself to be crucified. Jonah, I don't know, maybe he didn't wrestle back, but they threw him in the sea. And the similarities are amazing to me. He said, how can we stop this, you know? Look at what the men do next. I guess, you know, the question relating to that verse back there, you know, I think the comparisons between Jonah and Christ is kind of stark in a way. Because if you think about it, to us, this is a good description kind of of the human condition that we are in compared to the Christ, the Redeemer of, all, of the whole world. So in some ways, Jonah is symbolic of Christ, but he's also symbolic of us. You know, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, right? Who can even know it? So we are still have a, we still have a sin nature, and we still, and that is what's like Jonah. But because of the work of Christ, that is not how we're going to end up. So it's kind of interesting, too, how this symbolism between Jonah and Christ is kind of symbolic of a Christian and Christ also. So do you even care? You know, that's a good question that we can ask ourselves. Do we really even care if people are going to hell or not? Does that really even matter to us? Does it ever cross our mind? You know, when we see a crowd of people, how many, do we ever look out at that crowd and wonder how many of these people even know the Lord? Jonah, at this point, he's not thinking things like that at all. He said, just pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of this, great storm has come upon you. Look at what the men do next. However, the men rowed desperately to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. So now what do the men do? These men... Right, care more about Jonah than Jonah cares about them. You see how backwards he has become? Here you have these men, maybe they just started believing in the one true God. But at the same time, these were just good people. And see, that's the thing. Good, being a good person doesn't save you. Do you think these men were instantly just good people? This is who they were before. They were good people. They cared more about Jonah than Jonah cares about them. And they're trying to save his life still. But that's the thing. Being good isn't good enough. It takes perfection. 
And that's the relationship between us and Christ. Because we, if we've given our life to the Lord Jesus, we have the righteousness of Christ. So even though sometimes we may look a whole lot like Jonah, unfortunately, but at the same time, we are forgiven. And we have the perfection of Jesus Christ, and our sins are forgiven forever. Praise the Lord for that. I know in my life I've looked like Jonah quite a bit. We were joking this morning because I didn't do outside greeting today. I said, I guess I'm just being a little reluctant like Jonah. I should have got out, got out there, but I guess I'm kind of lukewarm. So guys, what I'm, tell, what I'm trying to urge us here together, we have a mission to reach people. You know, and storms are going to come about, problems, difficulties, and our job is to reach people. That's what matters. That's what really matters. Now, your life matters. It does. It does. But like I've told you before, but when we come before the Lord Jesus Christ and we look backward at a lot of the things we were so concerned about, I think they're going to be insignificant when we come before the Lord Jesus. So now these men are patting like crazy to try to save Jonah's life. So the men were rowing desperately to return to land, but they couldn't because it was even getting worse. Then they called on the Lord and said, listen to this. This is probably, well, I was going to say it's their first prayer, but they've probably been praying already to the God of the Hebrews while they were paddling trying to save Jonah and the ship. But look at what they say. Then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Now, there's several things here already. Look at this. They're, they're, they're proclaiming basically that God is sovereign, right? And they're asking for forgiveness for throwing Jonah overboard. So pretty amazing prayer for such young believers in the one true God, don't you think? But amazing to me how these men are behaving versus Jonah. It's amazing to me. You know, and look how they were baffled by Jonah's behavior. Yeah, I've told you before, sometimes we can act like Jonah, and it just baffles even an unbeliever if they know that we're a believer. We have to keep that in mind. We have to always be focused on that. Guys, if you pull out of this parking lot and you pull out in front of somebody, where are you pulling out from? You have just come to church. You're probably a Christian. And if that person is an unbeliever, what do they say? Oh, yeah, they're all just a bunch of hypocrites. Right? Have you ever thought about that? If you have a Jesus sticker on the back of your car, don't go swerving in and out of traffic. I mean, it's just common sense, but I see I've seen it happen. I've mentioned, I think it was a couple weeks ago, I mentioned how Melissa, she worked at Lowe's, and she said people would come in after church in their church clothes and act like a total idiot, just furious, raging about some return or something. They also heard a waitress at a restaurant. I asked her, I said, do you prefer to work the Sunday crowd? She says, no, the Sunday crowd doesn't tip as good as the Friday night, Saturday night crowd. I don't want to work it. Really? So have we totally lost what we're doing? I mean, to me, if that, if that is how the church is behaving, then we're behaving more like Jonah. Then we are these new believers, these sailors who are trying to fight for Jonah's life. So guys, we got to think, we got to think everywhere we go, we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So they called on the name of the Lord. We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, thinking of the similarities of Jesus Christ here, and I even think, this is my opinion, it doesn't say it, but as Jesus says, as I was in the heart of the earth for three days, Jonah was in the heart of the fish for three days, or sea monster, right? So I think, I want to know when I get there, but I'll bet you it was also Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the same days of the week. Now, if I'm wrong and we all get there, you can go, ah, you were wrong about that. But I bet you it was Friday, Saturday, or, and Sunday that Jonah was in the fish. And this is symbolic of Jesus being in the tomb, one sacrificed for the many, many saved as a result. 
Because of grace, the sea stopped raging. You know, I was thinking of the apostles, how they didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. You know, and how here the sailors, they didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. And they didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Surely not you. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Well, if they really understood, I knew they, they were close to him. They loved him. They didn't want him to go. But if they truly understood, like Jesus knew, if they truly understood that it is by him going to that cross that they would have forgiveness of sins, and without that, they have no hope. You see, the, see, so there's this reluctantly among the apostles. We don't want you to experience that. We don't want that to happen to you. The same way the sailors, they didn't want to throw him overboard. So they have mixed feelings here too. Yes, it solved the problem. But then again, they had to throw him overboard. So now they're without their only passenger, and they're also without their cargo, but they have their lives, but they have something even better. They have eternal life by faith looking forward to the cross as we look backward. And guys, that is what matters. The Bible says the angels rejoice in heaven when one person comes to Christ and repents. Now think of that. So now here they are. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So they feared the Lord greatly. Look, then the men feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So they believed the Lord, they feared the Lord greatly. This is belief. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord for forgiveness. And then they made vows. That's the process of becoming a believer, isn't it? We believe, right? And then our lives are supposed to be a reasonable service of worship. Our lives are also, pick up your cross daily and follow me, our lives are a living sacrifice to the Lord. When we come to the faith, we make a vow, I'm going to follow Jesus. So now, guys, if you are in here, and you look at your life, and you think, you know what, my life right now, I look more like Jonah than these sailors even. It's not too late. Turn it around. Turn it around because it matters. You know, every one of us has people in our spheres of influence who are not believers. Jonah is, he doesn't even care at this point. Do we? Do we? What matters most to God, do we even care about that? You know, we know that the, from Matthew 24 that famines, disease, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, all those things are going to increase. You know, and th things keep going the way they're going. I wouldn't be surprised at the collapse of the American dollar. I wouldn't. But at the same time, we don't have to fear those things. The Lord's going to take care of us. I'm not saying it won't be difficult. We don't have to fear those things. We need to start seeing those things differently. The reason those things are going to come about is because we will have an opportunity to tell more people. I used to do a Bible study for youth leaders at camp. And I would always tell them, look, there's 800 teenagers here. A lot of bad things are going to happen. It's inevitable. So, but look, that is an opportunity for us to respond in a godly way to problems. So we need to start seeing storms and problems and difficulties different. Because those things, when you take those problems, those storms, and someone adds God's truth to them, that results in salvations. So guys, who are you? Are we ready to stand in a storm or are we going to hide in the bottom of the boat? Do we even care? Maybe you're thinking today, I am as backward as Jonah is. Well, there's a way out. There is a way out from that. Or maybe you're here and you think, you know what, I, have, I, I don't know the Lord. Maybe you were like these sailors before the truth was finally forced out of Jonah's mouth. Well, then today can be the day of your salvation. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Your life becomes full of purpose to glorify the Lord. Your life is a living sacrifice under him now. And we make a vow to follow Jesus Christ and to live for him in our lives.
So if that's you, today could be the day of your salvation. And I pray that, I pray that you would make that. It would be the best decision you ever made. Just like these sailors, this storm was horrific. They nearly died. But I think when we get there, we'll have an opportunity to meet them. And I bet you they tell you that's the best thing that ever happened to them. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries of Pecan Baptist Church, go to our website at www.pecan.church or call 682-205-1565. We're located in Granbury, Texas. Services are each Sunday at 10 a.m.